I'll end with a discussion on a new uh, application that we've gotten involved with that's uh, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's simple signal processing, but it's a very unique application. Our customer here, uh, who gave me permission to talk about the app, but not who they were, so uh, you might figure it out. They're in the business of doing audio fingerprinting. So this application used a USRP N210 and a WBX daughter board to downconvert the entire FM radio band in a GNU radio application um, using software that already exists in GNU radio, demodulate all 50 potential radio channels, and pass the audio off as UDP streams um, to another signal processor. The idea here is that they could install an antenna, a USRP, and a rack mount server somewhere and get the audio from all the radio stations in that geography. The goal is to do this in all the major metro areas of the US. This company's uh, IP or their technique is they can take these demodulated audio streams and identify what song is playing. So now if I have this in 20 major cities, ma major metro areas, I pretty much know what all the radio stations are playing in the country. And it's based around the idea of using um, a this is a relatively new piece of code in GR Digital, our polyphase filtering uh, channelizer. This is used to break up 20 megahertz of wideband data into 400 kilohertz of, uh, by 50 channels, and then attaching FM demodulators only to the channels where you know there's radio stations. In the back. What's that? The, the channel spacing is at 200 kilohertz intervals, but the actual allocation is 400 kilohertz. If you have a radio station uh, that also does things like SCA and RDS, they'll take up a, a good 250 kilohertz of bandwidth. And if they have the uh, um, HD sidebands for like HD2, they'll take up the entire 400. Uh, this application, they only need four kilohertz of audio. So it's, or well, it's actually eight kilosamples, uh, four kilohertz, I made a typo there. So they don't need, you know, full fidelity stereo DMOD. This is a, a much simpler DMOD. Uh, but that DMOD is a, is a quadrature demodulator and a low pass filter. Uh, and a, um, they don't need equalization on theirs because they just do it in their fingerprinting. Um, but yeah, the channel spacing is 200, but the width is 400. You'll never see a st two stations 200 kilohertz apart. Uh, I'm sorry, what? I pick them up all the time. What's that? You do? I do. You're yeah, you're not supposed to. Yeah, you're not supposed to. It's, yeah. yeah. So as you might imagine, this is very CPU intensive to have a you know, 25 mega sample per second IQ stream coming into a, a box, running a channelizer filter bank, as well as you know, up to potentially 50 demodulators. Uh, and in fact, it is. Uh, when, um, uh, when we worked on this initially, the PFP channelizer was implemented as one GNU radio block. Turns out that the bandwidth or the CPU requirements of the demodulators were pretty small compared to what this was using. Um, ben here, I'll uh, give you kudos for this, was able to break this into three different blocks uh, so that it could work over multiple cores in the system uh, to allow this whole thing to work on a, uh, right now this is running on a six core, three gigahertz system to channelize all 50 channels. The most we've actually worked with is 37. Um, uh, but the application itself, uh, we've tested it, will go up to 50. Um, and then just getting the, the audio packets out and over, you know, they, they tell that into the device uh, and say, go send audio to this IP address. So they'll have this in, you know, radio tower in buildings, you know, in the middle of San Francisco and LA, Chicago, New York, Dallas, whatever, uh, Atlanta. 
And um, I mean, imagine having a iPhone app that you can pick your radio station to listen by what's playing. You know, it's, you already know what's on there, uh, or the fact that it's not playing; it's a commercial. Uh, you know, that's one potential use for it. Another potential use for it is um, the media companies that own the content that license it to the radio stations uh, don't have a great way of metering how often those songs are played. And so this data is actually pretty informative and quite valuable to them to enforce their IP contracts with radio stations. Uh, these DMODs could be stereo with RDS and SCA, um, but uh, this particular application doesn't need it because they're just fingerprinting. Um, think of trying to fingerprint the low bandwidth audio that you can upload over the network from an iPhone. Um, their system is designed to work with that quality of audio, so they don't need more than this. But it could be RDS, um, uh, uh, as well as the, uh, the SCA, um, and get the audio off of that. The fact that mono FM is extremely easy to demodulate and you don't need more than four kilosamples makes this pretty low in CPU, even though there could be 50 of them running in parallel. But I wanted to highlight this because one of the things that they're considering is rather than having to spend 50 times a six core server, if we can move this entire application into the FPGA, then this goes away. If there were a device that had a high-end um, FPGA and a low-end CPU along with it that could do this part, then they could deploy just that and the cost would go down at least by half. They might even want to go as far as taking that and building just a receiver board that does the wideband and everything all integrated. It's probably the money they would save by doing that, they'd spend in doing this. So it's probably a wash. Um, but uh, it's still a very kind of interesting uh, new area that uh, we think is going to be uh, a fun project uh, over the next few months uh, as they uh, roll this out. Okay, we're just a little bit early. It's 10.15. We can answer your questions. Uh, I think the schedule has us taking a, a coffee break and coming back to uh, see Balance first presentation on the Aviation Mapper. Um, Mr. Blum. Tom might. I don't think so. Everything that was in the constellation stuff, maybe. Some of the kind of, yeah, the introduction of the constellation objects does do a lot more in C++. I'll just repeat that. So, so the, the Python code that was doing uh, the generation and um, slicing of uh, arbitrary PSK constellations. I believe that was moved to C++. Um, okay, but, so the but yeah, the, and. There was a g the generic mod D mod block, all those kind of a, but that's, that's kind of underneath guts. Yeah. W was there something behind that question that was? I, I was kind of curious. Yeah. So, so Josh's question about the, um, implementation in C++ versus Python. It's one of the things in GNU Radio that historically um, all the signal processing happens in C++ uh, and sort of Python is a wrapper around that to build a, a signal processing flow graph, but none of the signal processing actually happens in Python. Um, that's not 100% true uh, in our digital code. Um, there are some things uh, that uh, uh, do use Python. Uh, there's also some niceties in Python that make it easier to use that than native C++. Uh, for building the outer wrapper around the application. Uh, but in general, um, if there's functionality in GNU Radio that you can only access from the Python API, uh, that's a candidate for us to push down into C++. Uh, and patches are always welcome. 
thought I saw a hand up uh, on this side. Maybe not. In the back. I, I apologize. I, I, I cannot hear you. Yes. Is it in Guinea Radio? No. So the question is, this PFP channelizer that's broken into multiple blocks uh, for performance reasons, that has not been integrated into Guinea Radio proper yet. Um, that is something that, um, because of the way it works, uh, it's going to be introduced on the next branch for 3.7 instead of 3.6. Uh, and there's a kind of a weird circular dependency that it has right now that we're trying to fix um, before we do that. Uh, so the answer is it will be. It's planned to be, but it isn't yet. So can I ask um, how many people are actually using the dead mean by captivating the radio? Oh, okay. This will this will be good for you, Maitland. Um, how many of you are, well, I'll start by saying, how many of you download the GNU Radio Tarball and go install the dependencies and, and do the configure and make and all of that, or CMake, um, by hand? Wow, okay. How many of you are using Marcus's Bill GNU Radio script? About the same number of people. Maybe it is the same people. Uh, <laughs> um, Marcus Leach, uh, uh, who unfortunately I don't think is here, um, developed a script for downloading not only GNU Radio, but several popular add-on packages um, to GNU Radio, um, installing all of the uh, application dependencies uh, and doing the compilation and installation all in one step. It works great. Saves a huge amount of time um, over doing it all manually. But uh, what Tom asked me to ask about was, traditionally, you wouldn't compile Firefox when you want to use it you'd go install it, or it might even come with your distribution. Um, GNU Radio uh, has been packaged and repackaged in different ways over the years, but it's now available uh, for the Debian and Fedora projects, uh, and as of 12.10 uh, release of Ubuntu will be available in the Ubuntu repository from scratch, or you know, by default. How many of you would prefer just to do that instead? Wow. Not a single hand. Well, maybe in the back. Oh, I've done both. I don't want to use the W. Uh huh. As a JIT, but that's 12.5. I, 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 you'd have to comment on the specific versions. I don't know what's, uh, what's packaged. There's a pass that got them from JIT. Then again, we are talking to people who come to a Gin Radio Developers Conference, so I yeah. imagine that they're probably yeah. more cutting edge than. Sure. But that is actually quite surprising, though, to see no hands up on who uses binary packages. Um, one thing that I typically see is that is, is the, uh, the ones that come packaged with, say, Fedora or Debian, a lot of times are behind several releases. Up until uh, very recently, until Maitland did this uh, work that he's done now, we had an ancient version 3.2 in, in De the Debian project. Uh, which was really bad because um, it was good when it came out, but it's not good anymore. Um, and so now that's been uh, corrected. And I believe Fedora has sort of had a slightly older version, but not too, not too painfully old of a version. Um, but I think we're at sort of a rhythm with releases now uh, where when the GNU Radio project cuts a release, the distributions can base, um, you know, we're, we're, we're releasing every... Uh, you know, every two to three months with a stable release. So, I mean, that's a cadence fast enough to where the, the distribution should be able to, to keep up with uh, and not have these ancient versions in there. Uh, but I, I, I kind of like to, to understand a little bit about the aversion of using binary packages to install GNU Radio. Is it because we love GCC and spending an hour waiting for it to finish, or? Uh, yeah, it is actually quite better, but. Um, Okay. Fa yeah, fair enough. If you know how to, if you know what, where to look, you can get it in Ubuntu and Debian now. But, um, but it's very new. Um, so let's assume it's all it's all there. It's all ready. Um, 
it's a lot of work that goes into making binary packages. There's a lot of things that have to be done correctly so that it can coexist with other binary packages on the same system. And is it worth it? Sure. So hopefully, um, yeah, his comment was that, uh, and even more so with the 3.7 API, we're breaking GNU Ready up into a large number of smaller components. Um, getting the, the monolithic binary installation gives you a bunch of stuff you may not need. We're actually trying to do the opposite. By breaking this up, packagers will be able to set up the dependencies the right way to where you can just install a subset uh, binary and just get you know, the audio codecs. Uh, if you want, or just get the you know the analog pieces because you're not doing any digital uh, RF stuff. Um, hopefully, that's the direction we can move in. Um, I know on embedded systems in particular, and for security auditing, you don't want code on the system that you don't normally run. Uh, so having the ability to just install minimal versions of GNU Radio is essential, and we think with the 3.7 API that'll be the case. Do you guys agree with that? I mean, that's kind of that's. Kind of my personal take, really. But. So if Josh will make it easy for me to do the right thing with packages, I love the way he said that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so perhaps maybe you're asking the wrong people that question. Because yeah. yeah. I think most of the people here are developers. Oh, yeah. right? yeah. I think when you do yeah. make a transition more to lots and lots of users, they're going to want the binary package stuff to be easy. They don't care if there's extra I think that's a fair comment, you know, that the developers are happy with, you know, source code installs. Um, but how many developers are modifying GNU Radio itself versus how many developers are writing applications that link to GNU Radio, but they're not actually modifying GNU Radio Core? If they're not modifying it, they should be happy with binary libraries and a set of header files. Yeah, but they want the latest yeah, so they don't wait for I, I'm sorry, what? Doug, did you have a? Sure, so I'll go back with the same comment. Uh, I, if I want the real, latest and greatest, I'm going to go get it from Git. But when eventually it transitions to some application, having the, the dev available eventually, I think, is important for the, the end. For deployment? Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll make a comment on, I'll make a comment on this is breaking up the, the blocks so that, for example, when I don't want unit radio containing, you know, if I'm going to have no X11. Yeah. Thing, since again, you know, we're, we're having comments now, and we want to keep all this on video. If you could kind of come up here, and Jonathan, if you'd hand them off the wireless mic, and then you use this guy. It might be, able, yeah. Well, or I can hand them this. So I don't have to take this off. Yeah. Will that work so for you guys? It, it, it right. Now we're putting on the spot to be put on video is the thing. So. So. I can't pass the mic around because the cord's not long enough. But if uh, if you really want your comment to show up for posterity, you can come up and uh, talk into the microphone. So Doug's comment was, as a developer, you want to get the latest and greatest. Um, you can get that with Git. But when you want to go deploy your application, well, you didn't use the word deploy. I did. But uh, when you want to install your application somewhere for an end user or whatever, having the, the binary package available for just what you need is useful. But as a developer, you don't really care. Is that a good summary? OK. In the so, doing the Git clone and getting it all is an important source of documentation because the source code for the whole system is the ultimate documentation as well. So, even if it's possible to do the development with the binary package, I'm still going to do the Git clone so that I've got it all there. So, I've got it on my laptop when I'm on the plane. So, the next person that complains about our documentation will say, check out the source code. <laughs> Well, I mean, to be, to be quite honest, that's how we work. We just refer to the source code. But, you know, we don't want to impose that on everyone. Um, but it sounds, you know, like maybe it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. But again, I think, I think the point that Scotty made was, was apt is that this is probably the wrong crowd to, to ask that question because you guys do 
you know, you're here because you use Unity Radio, therefore you are familiar with the tools and how to compile and build, but... Um, well, let me ask it another way. For us to, to know this. I'll ask it another way. How many of you are involved in developing software with GNU Radio where what you write will be executed by somebody else besides yourself? Okay. In those scenarios, being able to deploy that software to someone else uh, without them having to go install or you having to go install source code. Um, you know, binary packages in particular are useful for pulling in everything that they're dependent upon and letting the operating system package manager deal with all that uh, without you or your users having to do that. Uh, so it's really that situation. If you're writing software, you're going to run it yourself and you're happy with, uh, you know, doing a git clone and, and CMake and all of that, then there's nothing else we need to do. Um, I guess we're looking at it more like, you know, people are using GNU Radio in ways that are shipping applications based on it. How would they like to deploy GNU Radio as a source code compile, as a binary installation, as a something in between? Um, that's, that's kind of what I'm fishing for, is just to understand how important that is. So I, I didn't hear all of that, but I think what you said is you're rolling your own packages so that you can distribute them. Are these GNU radio packages or are they your own software you've written? Or both? Both. Okay. Um, CMake has built-in facilities for building, particularly for uh, what we call outer tree modules, uh, where you're writing your own code independently of GNU radio uh, to package that whole thing as a, um, a deb file. Um, probably as an RPM as well. I'm just not familiar with it. Um, so that's one way of doing that. Uh, you know, you can go, what, what package system are you making packages for? Uh, Debian. Debian, yeah. So, I mean, you can actually use the Debian tools to do it as well um, and build your own deployment packages. It's also very useful for upgrades to do that. So you don't have to uninstall source code from one tree, compile, and then reinstall source code for the new one. So it sounds like the deb packages are useful to a subset of people. Um, and perhaps not as important to people actually writing the code, um, but more to the people that are executing the code. All right. I think it's important to have the, the source code and the Debian packages uh, releasing at the same time, because if we are in the end developing a, an application with the latest version of the new radio, and I want to distribute it, I want to uh, make a package So, so being able to refer to the, the same version of source code um, as the binary packages you have installed. Of course, um, once, once Debian and Ubuntu push their next major distributions out or versions out, that'll be the case. You'll be able to install the source package as well as the, the binary package. Now, I, and, and again, I think that I think that we've gotten a relatively frequent release schedule now to be able to, you know, what you might install from a binary may only be three or four months old at most. Uh, the amount of time from the 3.6.1 release to the time that it got into the devs was a half an hour, um, you know, before you could do an app get install uh, and get it on 3.6.1. I don't know the status of 3.6.2 right now. Um, yeah. yeah. So right now we're on 3.6.2, and uh, you know we will probably be a while before we release a 3.6.3. But if you do an app get install, you'll get the code as of June. 
So July, August, you know, three, four months old is, is the time delay now rather than three or four years, which is what it was in the past.